What's going on, everybody? Jeff Holiday here, and here's part two of Catching Up with the Coronavirus. And today, we're going to jump right into it. Hopefully, you watched the first video, which is detailing out how anti-vax sentiment and, and talking points and propaganda is now hitting the mainstream in a very, very big way. You should go watch that. If you haven't watched it yet, you should go watch that one first, and then come back and finish this video. But I digress. Today, we're going to be talking about the quack cures and treatments and the problems surrounding the people that are trying to push these types of things. Just as a quick historical recap, some of you may remember uh, hydroxychloroquine, the, uh, the, the, the long-touted drug that even then-President Trump, uh, no longer President Trump, was trying to push as a miracle cure, even though that was not in fact the thing that saved his life when he himself got COVID-19. Fascinating. Can we can we quickly recap on what happened when he got COVID? Despite the Trump administration's attempts to downplay exactly how sick the president was at the time, more details have emerged since then. After he became sick, they needed to get FDA emergency sign-off for an experimental treatment. This is an 8-gram dose of two monoclonal antibodies through an intravenous tube. He was also given a first dose of the antiviral drug remdesivir. However, his condition continued to worsen, and eventually his blood oxygen level dropped to 93%, and he was given a powerful steroid, dexamethasone, which is usually administered if someone is extremely ill. It was all of these things combined which inevitably led to the president recovering an extraordinary amount that, while it was going on, most White House officials legitimately believed that he was going to die. And it was only through an extraordinary access to experimental medication, including some coming from Regeneron, which he himself had financial ties to. That company received $450 million in government funding in July as part of Operation Warp Speed. The notion that any private citizen could have the same kind of access as the most powerful man in the world is ridiculous. Yet, strangely enough, there are quite a few people who are hardcore devotees of said former president who don't want to be treated like lab experiments, yet are totally fine with him using experimental drug. You know what? It's okay. Fine. Whatever. You know what? Maybe the rules are just different for the leader of the free world or something. I mean, that sounds fair, right? But hydroxychloroquine was proven over and over and over again to be um, a nothing burger. A huge nothing burger. And in fact, we can look at that again real quick. So who remembers this? And a lot of good things have come out about the hydroxy. A lot of good things have come out. And you'd be surprised at how many people are taking it, especially the frontline workers, before you catch it. The frontline workers, many, many are taking it. I happen to be taking it. I happen to be taking it. Hydroxychloroquine? I'm taking it. Hydroxychloroquine. When, right uh, now, yeah. yeah when... Now, with hydroxychloroquine being promoted by the president, one would wonder if there was any evidence that it was going to be effective. Well, we now have quite a few of those answers, and it might shock you to find out exactly how quickly we knew it wasn't very effective. The recovery trial from the University of Oxford was a large, randomized, controlled, open-label study evaluating a number of potential treatments for patients hospitalized with COVID-19. Investigators reported that there was no beneficial effect or reduction of death in hospitalized patients with COVID-19 receiving hydroxychloroquine. In the study, 1,561 patients received hydroxychloroquine and were compared to 3,155 receiving standard care only. No difference was found in the primary endpoint, which was the incidence of death at 28 days. In addition, hydroxychloroquine treatment was associated with an increased length of stay in the hospital and increased need for invasive mechanical ventilation. In a multi-center randomized open-label controlled trial published in July 2020 by Cavalcanti and colleagues in the New England Journal of Medicine, hydroxychloroquine use was studied in patients who were hospitalized with mild to moderate COVID-19. Patients received hydroxychloroquine, and the clinical status of these patients at day 15 was not improved as compared with the patients receiving only standard care. A randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial from Skipper and colleagues was conducted in 423 outpatients. Patients received hydroxychloroquine orally, or a placebo. Researchers found that over a 14-day period, a change in symptom severity and the percent of patients with ongoing symptoms did not differ significantly between groups signaling no effect from the hydroxychloroquine treatment. 
Now, if you think that hydroxychloroquine is settled, you would be wrong because there are still repeated efforts and attempts by people, including some politicians, such as Senator Ron Johnson from Wisconsin, trying to say that hydroxychloroquine is, in fact, effective. And one of the reasons for this is this study. Observational study on 255 mechanically ventilated COVID patients at the beginning of the USA pandemic. And in this, they basically tried to claim that the survival rate was 2.9 times higher than other patients if they were taking a combination of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. However, this is flawed. The main problem that they were having was not that they were comparing those who were taking hydroxychloroquine. That wasn't what they were comparing. They were comparing one group of people who were taking hydroxychloroquine versus others that weren't taking as much hydroxychloroquine. Now, the reason for this can be very, very simple. The higher survival rate might be because those patients themselves survived and were able then to continue taking more medicine, whereas obviously those who had died were not going to be able to continue the treatment. And while I'm sure some of you might be wondering, is that actually a complete dismissal of it? Not necessarily, but you have to remember, this is a very small sample of very specific people. These are people that are actually on ventilators. These aren't just people that are in with a mild case of COVID. So, these 255 people, well, if they're ventilated, you're pretty much in bad shape already. Thus, given the credence that the main reason why these numbers are so skewed is largely because they died. Yeah, that's it. But with hydroxychloroquine effectively defeated as a miracle cure and a quack treatment, another has risen from the ashes to take its place. No, not jelly juice. Ivermectin. <laughs> Ivermectin has been around for quite a long time. It's an anti-parasitic drug used for treating things like heartworm, basically. And it's been used for humans, but mostly is used these days commonly with veterinarians. Now, the interest in ivermectin seems to originate from an Australian study published early in the pandemic that showed that high concentrations of ivermectin in vitro demonstrated antiviral activities. However... The problem with this is that it was later then investigated by the British Journal of Clinical Pharmacology, and they found that there was one major problem with it. To get the antiviral properties of that drug to activate, the high concentrations would mean that somebody would have to take an incredible amount. Incredible amount, because it does not, physiologically speaking, bind to blood proteins in the right way. Thus, to achieve what that initial study showed, you would have to be taking 8.5 times more the FDA-approved dose. The unfortunate side effect of this is early adopters of ivermectin in a desperate bid to find some way to fight against the COVID-19 pandemic started rallying this cry that this was being suppressed. An early adopter of this conspiracy theory was none other than quack superstar Dr. Joseph Mercola. And you can see already where this is headed because this is his article being posted on childrenshealthdefense.org, which is owned and operated by Robert F. Kennedy Jr., notable anti-vaxxer. In this, Mercola claims that ivermectin could have saved millions of lives, but doctors were told not to use it. And the main citation for this comes from an interview on the Dark Horse podcast, owned by Brett Weinstein, a member of the Intellectual Dark Web. And in it, he talks to a Dr. Pierre Corey, who is the President and Chief Medical Officer of the Frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance. Uh, full disclosure, I've met Brett Weinstein before. I attended a talk that he did. He seemed nice and thoughtful and um, kind of a pearl clutcher, to be honest. And it seems like in the absence of culture war things to talk about and get people riled up about and earn some Patreon bucks from, now some people, including Brett, 
have adopted the idea of embracing anti-vaccine talking points or COVID questionable or alternative treatments in order to maintain the steady flow of attention and money. I say this because as somebody who is as intelligent as he's supposed to be with his degree, with his PhD, he should know better. But here we are. All right, let's dive into this. We're going to take a long look at this podcast and find out what the real problems are. Now, the name of this episode is The Crime of the Century. Of course, this isn't priming the audience for any conspiratorial content that's going to show up a little bit later. Of course not. However, this podcast ultimately ends up being a massive, massive push to try and claim that ivermectin is the best way to treat COVID, not only for infections, but as a preventative. Take a listen to this. When you say this could end the pandemic, so I have a a friend online who's done a very good analysis, which uh, is on my Twitter feed if people want to look for it, a data analysis uh, analyst from Brazil. And he is very supportive. He agrees completely that ivermectin is a very important potential treatment for COVID and that we should be using it. And he quotes a chapter and verse. He says that it is overreaching to imagine this could end the pandemic. Now, I think he's incorrect, and I think I know why he's incorrect. He's obviously an honest broker, but I think he's being too cautious. But I would like to hear you. You've just said you think it could end the pandemic. Why do you say that? Well, I, my guess, and first I want to guess why he would said that, maybe because just based on the trial's evidence, he doesn't see it as being as effective as it could be. But uh, a couple of reasons why I think he's underestimating its power is that the trials really can't capture the efficacy perfectly because trials generally don't start day one. From here, Pierre Corey goes on to claim that there are further studies, there are meta-analyses, there is overwhelming evidence that ivermectin is, in fact, extremely effective. Now, this would be fine if you could actually show evidence of this. And granted, this is a podcast, so they don't necessarily have a full-blown list of citations. However, we can take a look at some of the websites that have been pushing ivermectin and the studies that they link, including one that was done by Pierre Corey himself. One of the first studies that Pierre Corey started trying to virally spread all across the internet was this one. The Mechanisms of Action of Ivermectin Against SARS-CoV-2, an evidence-based clinical review article. Now, on the surface level, anybody who's a layman reading this would be kind of compelled by what they found. One of the main problems with this, however, is that they found that ivermectin inhibits the activity of a protein, important that according to them blocking the nuclear transport of viral proteins blocking the nuclear transport of viral proteins as in the viral proteins inside the nucleus however given that the viruses replicate in the cytoplasm the rest of the cell other than the nucleus that doesn't make a whole lot of sense but that's not the only problem This was also published in a much smaller offshoot journal from Nature, and it holds apparently a record for being received and then published in record time. Very, very similar to predatory pay-to-publish journals. That also is another red flag. But on top of that, the only human evidence cited by the authors comes primarily from a pro-Ivermectin website, which is ivmmeta.com. Strangely enough, very, very similar to hcqmeta.com, which was basically the same thing but for hydroxychloroquine. It is rumored that they're possibly run by the same people. However, the abuse and misunderstanding of p-values by these people is quite interesting, and the authors of that analysis apparently copied information from a paragraph on the website. The amount of evidence is incredible. Another quote-unquote paper that is used like a blunt object trying to hammer ivermectin down everybody's throats comes from the Bird Group, which is a UK-based group, primarily uh, focused on just, well, getting everybody to take ivermectin. Now, what they did was they took a meta-analysis. They like to paint this as a slam-dunk, gold-standard, Cochrane-level review and meta-analysis against COVID-19 by using ivermectin. Now, there are 
huge problems with this, as I'm sure you kind of guessed I was about to say. One of the main issues with this is there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of quality control for the types of studies that they were looking at. Some of these studies were extremely small, one as small as 24 patients, and many of them were not double-blind, and a rather significant number, in fact, open label in which everyone knows which patients are in which treatment group. That isn't to say this is the case with all of them, because it's not. There are actually some rather high-quality studies that are included in this meta-analysis. When all of these are combined and put through the numbers, it shows that ivermectin reduces the risk of death in treated patients by 62%, and that is is rather wild. However, an epidemiologist, Gideon MK, aka the health nerd, took it upon himself to try and run those numbers again, just removing some of the less trustworthy of studies. And in his new analysis, he excluded two studies in specific. The first one has a very high risk of bias, largely because of the randomization and makeup of the patients that they were looking at. And the second one largely because it's missing massive pieces of information. There's no information on allocation concealment, and the two sentences on randomization procedures are completely contradictory. Because of that, and because these are effectively low-quality studies and bad information, he took them out. But if this is a meta-analysis, and all of these other papers are left in, we should surely see that there's still a strong correlation, especially given the high-quality analyses are still intact. Well, I'll just let Gideon explain what he found. This basically shows that without those two studies, the analysis demonstrates no benefit for ivermectin at all compared to placebo, with the confidence interval that includes everything from a big benefit to a large harm from the drug. Interestingly, the between-study heterogeneity also reduces when you do this from about 50 to 6.6%, which is lower than the value the authors give in their sensitivity analysis in the paper. What this means is that, if you exclude some of the low-quality research on ivermectin, the paper goes from showing a massive benefit to no benefit at all. On top of this, there's an interesting point. Even if you don't agree with these assessments, taking the only three studies of the authors of meta-analysis considered to be at a low risk of bias, i.e. high quality, you find that these high-quality studies have failed to find any benefit for ivermectin. In other words, while the conclusions the authors came to are very positive, the results section of the paper seems to show that the evidence for ivermectin might not be strong after all. The devil really is in the details with research like this. Great. Well, let me say, um, I think the evidence is incredibly compelling. Now, we're going to take a quick pause here, and I'm going to address something that's a bit of an elephant in the room. Now, I've stated that when you remove these two studies, then you get a very different result. Well... One of those in specific we really need to pay attention to. This was one of the largest study sample sizes, 600 people. And this is known as the Elgazar paper. Now, there are serious, serious problems with this study. And we're going to go through them real quick because you have to understand, this has been one of the most virally spread studies out there, used as a triumphant war cry that ivermectin can save us, and also, by the way, we don't need vaccines anymore. So let's look at this. The conclusions of the study are amazing. They're incredible. It found that people treated with ivermectin were 90% less likely to die than people who got the placebo, which would be an absolute triumph. This, this would make it one of the most effective uses of any drug in the history of medicine. However... Right at the very beginning of the paper, it appears that the entire introduction is plagiarized. You can actually do this yourself. If you look at this paper, which there is a link in the description down below, you can copy the introduction and paste it into Google, and you will find that it came from an entirely different paper. But that's not all. The authors of the paper uploaded the actual data sets they used for the study online. And while this would be a breach of ethics, it's password locked. However, the password to access it was 1234. I, I, I wish I was joking. However, this leads us to some further damning information because as we look at the people who are involved, the people who are actually in the study, we find that there are duplicates, copy and pasted, Sometimes the very same initials, the exact same comorbidities, lymphocyte scores, etc., etc. These cannot be 
just simply a coincidence because of how often it happens. But it gets worse. If you dig into the actual data set itself, they, they sometimes don't even know how to accurately display their information. There is far too much information completely filled out, which a study of this size, there is bound to be gaps. And in all ways, this looks like it could be a case of classic scientific fraud. And that's bad. It's very bad. It, it, any number of these issues would be enough to dismiss this study completely. But what makes this worse is that this study has been used in almost every meta-analysis that's used and passed around to promote that ivermectin is effective in treating COVID. The, the, even though this has been retracted, this paper is retracted, it is still used as a heavy-hitting piece of evidence in meta-analyses. And unless you yourself go and break down which studies are involved in it, you would never know. And that the fact that it is compelling and yet not widely known is um, an important fact in and of itself. And lastly, we're going to look at the actual study that Pierre Corey did, or rather, another meta-analysis. This was... Review of the emerging evidence demonstrating the efficacy of ivermectin in the prophylaxis and treatment of COVID-19. Now, just to get this out of the way, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say it right now. This includes the Algazar study. Yep, it includes the Algazar study, of course. And, in fact, it had to be turned down by Frontier Science News, and they issued a media statement about this. Regardless of the publication stage or subject of a manuscript, if the integrity of an article is called into question, our policy is to investigate. Upon further scrutiny by our research integrity team about the objectivity of this paper during the provisional acceptance phase, it was revealed that the article made a series of strong, unsupported claims based on studies with insufficient statistical significance, and at times, without the use of control groups. Further, the authors promoted their own specific ivermectin-based treatment, which is inappropriate for a review article and against our editorial policies. Now, to elaborate on this a little bit further, this meta-analysis done by Corey himself includes pay-for-publish predatory journal studies. It includes every single trash piece of propaganda, whether real or not, to try and build a case for ivermectin. He then also uses this study to try and promote these protocols in which they are trying to implement on their website. But I think we also need to hear something very important from Pierre Corey and, and Brett Weinstein regarding the preventative possibility of ivermectin. Real quick. Safe, highly effective, not only highly effective at treating these patients, but treating but preventing people from coming down with COVID. A few moments later. Uh, I actually broke through and got COVID last week. My daughter got it. <laughs> or hey, how about the claims they make on Brett Weinstein's podcast about India? Ivermectin is saving India, right? If you look at India, in that crisis, finally you saw a crack in the wall and they started to speak the word Ivermectin. And you actually had, I think it's the ICMR, Indian Council of Medical Researchers, who's one of their uh, main public health bodies where a lot of the doctors look to. They included ivermectin in their treatment guideline during this crisis. And it is true. Back in May, Indian state will offer ivermectin to entire adult population, even as the WHO warns against its use as COVID-19 treatment. Well, that's interesting, except... DGHS drops ivermectin, doxycycline from COVID-19 treatment, ICMR rules unchanged. And the reason for this was, surprise, surprise, they could find no evidence that ivermectin was actually working. Now, there is just one more thing that we need to tackle about this podcast before we can finally move on from it. I, I am increasingly annoyed at the moniker anti-vax because yeah. I feel it's being used as a weapon. I've had it directed at me. And if you pay really close attention, you can kind of notice that a lot of these talking points are starting to mirror things that anti-vaxxers have been saying for a long time. I am not anti-vax. 
right? Whatever that means. And I'm also not anti-vaccine. In va- as a matter of fact, I'm very pro-vaccine. I sure. think it's one of the greatest tools in our medical toolkit. Now, longtime viewers of this channel might remember the historical moment where Andrew Wakefield himself, the godfather of the anti-vax movement, said that he himself is not anti-vax. He's just anti this vaccine, specifically mentioning the MMR vaccine. The words were that the safety studies, the pre-licensing safety studies of MMR vaccine were largely inadequate, particularly compared with the single vaccines. In other words, the safety studies of the single vaccines were better. Now, if that sounds familiar, take a listen to this. You're not an anti-vaccine person. No, no, not at all. No, I'm fully vaccinated. So are my kids. I mean, yep. uh, not not this vaccine because I have uh, an alternative that I, I'm much more comfortable with. That's safe. That's personally, yeah. yeah and I use too. ivermectin. And so, um, again, I want to see more data on these vaccines. And it's, I don't know, I just feel it's a reasonable clinical judgment. That's right. All. Well, I mean, let's go back to the Argentina study that you talked about where it was like 58% yeah. in the one group. Uh, got it, and the ivermectin treated group zero got it, right? So how good is the protection from ivermectin? The answer is it appears to be absolutely stunningly excellent. Oh, hey, look, another study to examine. Okay, fine. Well, in this study, they basically claim that it has a 100% prophylactic rate, which is if you take it, you can't get COVID. There are a lot of problems with this paper, but I'm just going to point out some very, very basic ones. They recruited 1,195 healthcare workers from four major Argentinian hospitals, of whom 788 were given a combination drug regimen that included ivermectin. Not just ivermectin, but a drug regimen. And the 407 workers who did not receive ivermectin had an infection rate of about 58%. Among the 788 who received it was zero. No cases at all. There's a problem with this, however, because there was also two different types. There was this study and then a follow-up study as well, where they replaced the five times a day regimen to a once weekly dose regimen, and they got the same result. Perfect protection from COVID-19. The main issue with this, the first one is that they reported no cases weeks after stopping to take the drug. And then in the second one, it was on a once a week dose. The half-life of ivermectin is 18 hours. So how then did this miraculous effect take place? One might argue that maybe it it didn't. But anyway, here's a little bit more, right? <laughs> and so how good is the protection from the vaccines? Well, it's pretty darn good, but it's not it's not 100. It's not 100%. No. So in any case, from the point of view of how, how safe are you, I agree. It's the um, it's the, the better treatment. Uh, I actually broke through and got COVID last week. My daughter got it. Because when people talk about this drug, when they talk about hydroxychloroquine, they're talking about these as alternatives to vaccines. That's what they want. Make no mistake. These people are not actually interested in this on its own, they want it so it can be an alternative to vaccines. Because these are anti-vaxxers. They'll say, no, 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 I'm not an anti-vaxxer. No, 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 I just have questions. No, no, I just want to, I want to look at it. It's all obfuscation. It's all a bunch of talking out of both sides of your mouth. When in reality, they are anti-vaxxers. These people are anti-vaxxers. Hands down. And they want this to be an alternative. Now, what's fascinating about it, too, is these are also usually people who, uh, they, they might have some condemnations about the medical industry, and they'll say things like, well, the medical industry will never cure this thing because there's more money in a treatment. Yet, for some reason, the idea of prolonged and free protection from COVID infections That seems wrong to them, but a drug that you would have to continue to use each time you got reinfected seems totally fine to them. Weird, huh? And it's at this point in the video that things are going to take a really, really dark turn. Um, I feel pretty rough. I've got a very high temperature. This makes some pain, some shivers, cold in my extremities. I hope I've got it. I hope it is COVID. Um, because I'd rather have the antibodies in my blood than take the jabs. Anyone who knows my opinion, anyone who has 
followed my comments on um, on my Facebook page knows what I feel about the jab then but the dangers of potential dangers from taking the experimental jab for me are not worth that risk I'd rather take my chances with my immune system these are things that we have to suffer it's part of living you have to trust your immune system and if the alternative is that we live in fear that we create a bogeyman out of something that hopefully I'm showing isn't anything to be afraid of for 99.9 percent .9 of us COVID vaccine refuser died after terrible mistakes, says Partner. A man who died with COVID after refusing to be vaccinated made a terrible mistake which put his family at risk, as Partner has said. Leslie Lawrenson, 58, died at his home in Bournemouth, Dorset, on the 2nd of July. His partner, Amanda, who was seriously ill with COVID at the same time, said he thought the vaccines were too experimental. She told Stephen Nolan program on BBC Radio 5 Live, I feel incredibly foolish. Les died unnecessarily. Ms. Mitchell said her partner, a Cambridge University graduate, decided against having a coronavirus jab after reading material on social media. She said it was a daily thing that he said to us. You don't need to have it. You'll be fine. Just be careful. He said to me, it's a gene thing, an experimental thing. You're putting something in your body that hasn't been thoroughly tested. Les was highly educated, so if he told me something, I tended to believe it. Miss Mitchell, who has diabetes and hypertension, said her partner appeared to be recovering from COVID-related pneumonia while she became seriously ill. She said paramedics who attended her at home on the 2nd of July were called back 10 minutes later when her 19-year-old son found Mr. Lawrenson dead in bed. She said Les made a terrible mistake and he's paid the ultimate price for that. Miss Mitchell was admitted to hospital the same day and spent a week on a COVID ward. She said she felt foolish for putting her daughter and older son at risk when they came to help care for the couple's 11-year-old son. Daughter, Carla Hodges, 35, said Leslie was so brainwashed by the stuff that he was seeing on YouTube and social media. He said a lot of people will die more from having the vaccine than getting COVID. Miss Mitchell said she would be having the vaccine as soon as doctors declared her fit enough. Now, just to really drive this point home, these were the common things that Leslie... A lawyer, not a stupid man, a lawyer was posting on his social media. Look, I'm going to be straight with you. When somebody starts talking about a cure or a treatment or basically any kind of mishmash of that type of talking point, they're usually talking out of their ass. And usually it's a grift. Usually it's somebody just trying to sell something to you, to take advantage of you, to take advantage of your fear or your paranoia. What they want to do ultimately is find a way to control they find a way to control, and then they can get something from you. That's what they want. That's what they want. Every single time. So when these types of talking points come up, you can kind of approach them from a, a realm of automatic skepticism. And it's probably the safest way to do it. It really is. Now, I know it's hard for some people to just embrace the idea of trusting experts. I get that. I totally, totally get that. But the alternative is to have people like this Filling your head full of garbage, garbage and misinformation that when applied incorrectly in a larger society where there are people who are vulnerable will get people killed. And there is no way for these people to actually face any repercussions if it happens to your family. They're not going to feel bad about it and they're not going to have to deal with any repercussions because of it. In essence, you will find many people saying, well, you know, lives are at stake and what you're saying on your podcast is going to result in the death of people. And this is, um, on the one hand, as we ourselves have said before anyone else said it about us, obviously there are lives at stake. And so we take this very seriously. On the other hand, it is cheating to hold us responsible for this. The correct honorable way to do this is to recognize that lives are at stake in the public health policy questions and your personal health decisions with respect to how you choose to protect yourself from COVID. That is true. What that means is that a great deal rests on how the evidence is interpreted. And there you have it, right there. It's not actually my fault. It's the way that dude chose to interpret the conclusions that I had already fed him. What a humanitarian you are, Brett Weinstein. Nothing. They stand to absolutely lose nothing 
if you follow their advice and that advice turns out to be wrong. So, as I always say, and this is paramount, you have to stop trusting YouTubers. Even me. You don't know me. Maybe some of you out there have met me, and I'm sure we had a very charming experience, and it was very nice and lovely meeting you. But do you know me? Do you know me? Do you have any reason to believe that I have your best interests in mind more than them? Or how about them versus your doctor? Or them versus uh, your family and your friends? The person that you should be trusting the most about these types of things is you. Your ability to cut through bad, negative misinformation and find stuff that is actually verifiable and backed up by the types of experts that have the business talking about it. You are the one should, that should be empowering yourself and finding it to make the right decisions. Because I can tell you, because it's true, that I'm right. Because I am. Because my takes and my, my opinions are based on science. But you should find that out for yourself. Otherwise, you could get taken advantage of by shitheads like this. Anyway, that's going to be it for me today, guys. I hope we caught up with most of the stuff surrounding the coronavirus. Ugh. And I hope it was worth the wait. Um, <laughs> summer is always a very busy time for me. It's hard for me to get a whole lot of work done. There's kids not in school. Don't have a lot of free time. And uh, have a new puppy. Oof. Anyway, expect that things will be getting back to normal much, much sooner rather than later. I appreciate you guys so much. Thank you for your attention. If you can help in any way to either spread these videos on social media so at least we can kind of counteract some of this garbage, I'd appreciate it. If you feel like supporting me, I do have a Patreon. I do have some reward levels over there. You can come watch me on Twitch. All that jazz. All that good stuff. But I hope that you are well. And I hope that your family is well. And from mine to yours, take care of yourselves. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye, everybody.